Chapter 13 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Laura reappears. And what was Dacre doing all this time? He had been wandering to and fro like a man with no object in life. He had visited the west coast and the hot springs, had even tried the diggings. It is not necessary to specify which of the gold fields was the scene of his visit and worked hard at a claim, but, growing disgusted at his want of success, had bought a nugget from a more fortunate chum and a splendid opossum rug from another, and started on a trip to Australia. From Sydney he was very near commencing a trip to the Fiji Islands, but one night he had a dream. Lucy Cunningham stood by him and offered him one of the soft curly rings which lay so charmingly upon her forehead, just clipped from its station on her pretty head. He stretched out his hand for it eagerly, and awoke to find that memory would not consent to be killed even by a constant change of scene. After this, he endured a day of such thorough blues that he decided upon going home, and it seemed to him that he could only carry out this plan by way of New Zealand, and especially of that part where Maungarewa was situated. He had a hundred excellent reasons why no other route than this was at all practicable. For one thing, he had not yet completed his assortment of mower bones, and he had heard that some excellent specimens were to be procured in the neighbourhood of Maungarewa, when he took up his abode in the nearest township to Mr. Cunningham's station, he found that the musical clique of the district were upon the eve of giving a concert. It was for a charitable purpose, and everyone who possessed any musical talent had promised to give their assistance. One day Dacre met Clinton Meredith riding through the town. They greeted each other, and then Dacre asked after Miss Cunningham. She was quite well when I saw her last, said Clinton stiffly. He could never divest himself of an unaccountable feeling of jealousy towards Dacre. Dacre took no notice of his manner. "'Are you going to sing at the concert next week?' he asked pleasantly. "'Yes,' returned Clinton, adding, with a touch of his usual self-assertion, "'they say they can't do without me.' "'Ah, indeed,' said Dacre. He had found out all he wanted now, and had no wish to prolong the conversation. If Clinton was to sing, no doubt Lucy would be there, and there he determined to see her and speak to her for the last time, he assured himself, and shut his eyes to the fact that he had come to that neighbourhood for just such an opportunity, and for no other reason. Lucy, meanwhile, never thought about him at all. Her heart was full of grief at the loss of her girlfriend, and she was trying as far as she could to fulfil her promise to Effie Lennox. As much as lay in her power, she endeavoured to fill Effie's place to poor little Jeanie. She found, too, that this was an easier task at first than she had imagined. Jeanie mourned truly and sincerely for the sister she had lost, but it was a necessity to her to cling to the one who offered herself in bodily presence to fill up the void. Quand on n'a pas ce qu'on aime, il faut aimer ce qu'on a. Jeanie's was a nature which realised the truth of this axiom intensely, so that Lucy, who had never dreamed of being looked upon quite in the same light as Effie, found that Jeanie had accepted her, though not without tears, as a substitute, and was daily becoming more and more reconciled to the exchange. Of course it was out of the question for Jeanie to attend the concert, but Mr. Cunningham wished to go, and wished to take his daughter, and Lucy herself wanted to hear Clinton sing. So she dressed herself for the occasion on the day appointed, though somewhat sadly, with many a longing wish for the lost friend who would never share any pleasures with her again. She had chosen to wear the very simplest toilet of black and white, half mourning in fact, a necklace of Roman pearls and a red rose which Clinton had given her in her hair, were the only ornaments she had allowed herself but there was one person at the concert who thought her looking more captivating than ever the moment he set eyes upon her. Alas, for Dacre's good resolutions. He found himself when seated on the opposite side of the room to Miss Cunningham, and in fact in an excellent position for watching her as much as he pleased without being himself observed. Still, he could not help wishing for a glance of recognition, and this he set himself at once to gain. The gentleman seated by Lucy's side he guessed, and correctly, to be her father, and to Mr. Cunningham Dacre was determined to obtain an introduction before long. Lucy, for her part, was scarcely seated before she caught a glimpse of a yellow beard, and became aware that Lewis was seated a few rows in front of her, and immediately behind a party consisting of two ladies and a gentleman. On the row before her were the Priors and Mr. Wistanley, Mrs. Pryor looking handsome in black silk with scarlet poppies in her hair, her husband obviously proud of her, and Arthur Wistanley half asleep as usual. Lucy caught her brother's eye and nodded to him, and he came to speak to her for a moment. After he had gone back to his place, and before the performers had made their appearance on the platform arranged for them, 
Lucy again became conscious that someone was bending forwards and trying to catch her attention from one of the seats at the other side of the room, and almost in a line with those occupied by her father and herself. She turned her head slightly and encountered a certain pair of bright brown eyes which she had not forgotten. What is Dr. Dacre doing here, I wonder, was her first thought. And then, what an uncommon looking face he has. He is a man to single out of a crowd. Dacre, having obtained what he wanted, Lucy's bow and smile, drew back quietly and looked another way. But he told himself next moment that he was rightly punished for having come there at all, when he saw that Lucy had forgotten all about him, for Clinton Meredith had come onto the platform and was just about to sing. He was quite right. Lucy had entirely forgotten him. All her thoughts were now absorbed by the evening's entertainment, which had already begun. It was not until the interval between the first and second parts, when the performers had subsided behind a curtain hung to shelter them from profane eyes during their brief breathing space, that Lucy found herself again at liberty to survey some of the audience around her. Suddenly she touched her father's arm. Papa, she said, do you see those people in front of Lewis? One of those two ladies came out with us in the Flora MacDonald, but she was a second-class passenger. It's the one with the black velvet round her neck. Isn't she handsome? Mr. Cunningham looked in the direction she indicated to him, and immediately replied in the affirmative. He did not think he had seen such a handsome woman since he came out to the colony. Mr. Pryor, in front of him, overheard the remark and was inwardly disgusted, regarding his own wife as a far finer specimen any day. But had the proposition been put to the general vote, Mr. Pryor would certainly have found himself in a minority. The party in front of Lewis Cunningham consisted, as I said before, of two ladies and a gentleman. There was sufficient resemblance between all three as to indicate that the relationship of brother and sister existed among them. But the gentleman was short and stout in figure, and could never have had any pretensions to good looks, even had his face not been so exceedingly sulky, while the two ladies, on the other hand, were both tall and uncommonly handsome. They had graceful, stately figures, thick black hair and large grey eyes. They were remarkably alike. Only when you compared them together you saw that one of them was older than the other, and that her beauty was nearer its wane. The elder lady was dressed plainly in black grenadine. The other was in white, set off with coral ornaments, coral round her neck and wrists, and thick strings of coral twisted in her splendid black plaits of hair. She wore also, round her throat, a broad black velvet band. None of these ladies, whose costumes I have noticed in this chapter, wore dresses cut low in the neck, or what would be considered full dress in England. It was an understood thing at the time I write of, and in that part of the New Zealand colonies, that ladies were never to appear before a colonial audience in anything but demi-toilet. Lucy had just finished the observations she was making of Mrs. Keith's party, when something attracted her attention near her home, and her eye fell carelessly on the people immediately before her. Then she gave an involuntary start, for she saw to her amazement that Arthur Westanley was awake at last. The change was remarkable. Five minutes ago he had been languidly studying the programme of the songs which he held in his hand, and evidently wondering when the whole affair would be over. Now the sleepy eyes had suddenly lit up, the sulky mouth was actually quivering, the man's whole attitude expressed eagerness and alertness in every line. What was it that had aroused him at last? Lucy followed the direction of his eyes. They were fixed upon the two ladies to whom she had just been calling her father's attention. After a moment she became certain that he was watching them and even when he recollected himself and drew back into his seat, half shading his eyes with his hands for a minute or two, she saw that his excitement had still by no means subsided. He was so quiet through it all, however, that no one had noticed him except Lucy, and even she could not tell from the expression on his face what was the nature of his repressed agitation. Whether it were joy or sorrow, anger or pleasure, she had not the slightest idea. A minute afterwards, however, she saw that his hand was trembling so much he could no longer hold the little slip of pink paper containing the printed programme of the evening's entertainment. It had fallen to the ground, and the next instant Arthur Westanley rose from his seat and slipped quietly out of the room. A little while, and someone behind Lucy said, not loudly, but in a distinct tone which could be heard all round, A person outside has fainted. Is there a medical man in the room? Dr. Dacre rose at once, making an affirmative gesture with his hand, and then he too disappeared, and Lucy found herself feeling somewhat nervous, and her cheeks hotter and more flushed than they had been a short time before. End of chapter 13 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 14 of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher The End of the Concert 
Dr. Dacre was not away long. He soon returned and resumed his seat, looking so cool and unconcerned that Lucy felt quite reassured by one glance at his face. And in about half an hour, Arthur Westanley too came in, very pale, but quite himself again to all outward appearance. Just as he entered, it became Clinton's turn to sing his last solo. This was nearly at the close of the evening. Lucy made her father applaud Clinton vigorously, and he got the encore he wished for. Then came a glee, and then, God save the Queen, when, of course, everyone rose. After this, the people streamed out. Those who chose to wait until the crush was over grew into isolated little groups, and were full in view of each other. The Priors, Arthur Westanley and Mr. Cunningham, formed one of these. Clinton was hunting for some music on the platform, and Lewis was with him. Lucy had gone to fetch some wraps from the small room at the entrance used that night as a cloakroom, and Dacre, having waylaid her as she came out, was getting the interview he had been looking forward to for so long. Not very far from the platform, the two ladies who had interested Arthur Westanley so much were still standing. Mr. Westanley detached himself from his own party and walked quietly down the room towards them. As he drew near, the younger lady with the coral in her hair suddenly dropped her fan. Arthur made a hasty step forwards as though to restore it to her, but she was too quick for him. She picked it up and turned rather away from the rest of her party as she did so. Anyone who had noticed her face at this moment would have seen that it expressed the blankest dismay. Arthur Westanley immediately addressed her. He spoke a very few words in an undertone, but all the world might have heard what he said. It was simply a request to know when and where it would be convenient to her to grant him an interview. She replied in the same tone and naming a time and place. This was all that passed between them. He bowed, and she returned the salute, and then he walked away again back to his own friends. The whole affair had not lasted two minutes, and her face never lost its startled expression till he had fairly gone. On his way up the room he passed Lucy and Dacre. Dacre turned and looked hard at him as he went by with a somewhat puzzled face. Lucy ventured to ask him if that was not the gentleman who had been taken ill that evening. Yes, Dacre returned, it is. But what puzzles me is that I seem to remember having met him before, and I cannot recall where. He stood a moment, evidently taxing his memory for something that had escaped him, and apparently in vain. His name is Mr. Wistanley, said Lucy. But this did not enlighten Dacre in the least. I have seen the fellow before somewhere, he said. Of that I am certain, and it must have been under a different name. But where and when I met him I cannot recollect at all. Lucy did not feel able to help him any further, but she thought it strange, if he were indeed right in his conjecture, that Arthur Wistanley had not already recalled himself to Dacre's remembrance. Quite a little hum of conversation was going on at the upper end of the room. Mr. Brown played exquisitely, didn't he? I was quite enchanted. Those leader honor vorta are so bewitching. And how sweetly Miss Jones sang. Did you observe Mrs. Robinson's dress? Pearl grey silk and blue convolvulus in her hair. So lovely. She has just had a box from home. No doubt that sweet silk came in it. The applause from the diggers behind was less uproarious than I expected. Who was the poor man that fainted, I wonder? The heat was enough to make any fellow faint. Why did not someone open a window? So ran the comments of the upper ten thousand upon the evening's amusement. Papa, said Lucy, I want to introduce you to Dr. Dacre. Mr. Cunningham took a fancy to Dacre's face, and invited him to Maungarewa on the spot. Clinton Meredith joined him, and they all four left the room together, followed in a moment by the Priors and Arthur Wistanley. The instant they had disappeared, Laura looked at Lewis, and made him the slightest possible signal with her fan. He was by her side in a moment. End of chapter 14 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 15 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Mrs. Lennox Becomes Confidential. Lucy had promised to ride round by Deepdean on her way home the day after the concert, and tell Jeanie all about it. Lewis, having some business to transact with Mr. Lennox, had promised to escort her. They reached the house about five o'clock p.m., just an hour or two before dinner. Jeanie was out somewhere in the garden, but Mrs. Lennox came to meet Lucy, and gave her, as usual, a hearty welcome. The evenings had now begun to grow short and cold. After Lucy had taken off her riding habit, they repaired to the drawing room, and were glad to find a good fire glowing in the grate. Mrs. Lennox placed two easy chairs before the hearth for herself and her visitor. The room was empty except for Lucy and herself, and it was fast getting dusk. Neither could see the other's face very distinctly as they sat before the fire. 
It was, in fact, quite a confidential sort of hour, and, everybody being out of the way, Mrs. Lennox took advantage of it, and settled herself down for a comfortable talk. "'My dear,' she said, after a short pause, during which Lucy, tired with her ride, was beginning to grow drowsy under the combined influence of the luxurious easy chair and the warmth from the red embers. "'Lucy, my dear, I want to speak to you about Jeanie. Something very particular, indeed.' Yes, returned Lucy, rousing up immediately. About Jeanie, what is it, Mrs. Lennox? It is a matter of very great importance, my dear, said the elder lady, smoothing down some of the trimming, black crepe, alas, on her dress as she spoke. Lucy made up her mind immediately that she was going to be consulted about the best way to make Jeanie's new French merino, or whether it was proper that the little lady in her deep mourning should wear large gold earrings as she insisted upon doing. Matters of importance with Jeanie and her mother generally meant something of this description, as Lucy was aware. She still felt very sleepy, and while Mrs. Lennox spoke, her eyes were fixed on her own pretty bronze slippers, with pink bows snugly ensconced upon the fender, and she was considering whether her next pair of boots would look best with round or square toes. However, in all this she was really doing Mrs. Lennox great injustice, for that lady certainly had something of importance to say. "'Perhaps you have noticed a little yourself, my dear,' Mrs. Lennox went on presently, and you won't be surprised, I think, at what I am going to tell you. The fact is that a certain gentleman who has been here pretty often has really paid Jeanie some marked attentions, and I wanted to consult you as to whether it would be a desirable match for her or not, for I think your father seems to know him well. Not the slightest hint of the truth had as yet dawned on Lucy's mind. She ran over in her head the names of half a dozen professed admirers of Jeanie's, without being able to discover to which Mrs. Lennox referred. Several of them had been often at Deepdean, but which had been the most pointed in his attentions she was unable from her observation to decide. So, with a strong feeling of curiosity growing within her, she inquired, "'Who is it, Mrs. Lennox?' "'Then you haven't noticed anything?' said Mrs. Lennox, slightly disappointed. "'But perhaps it was not likely. Now I come to think of it, I remember his visits here have never happened to take place at the same time as yours, except once. But that was weeks ago. Before... before we lost Effie.' Still no hint of the truth had flashed upon Lucy. The sudden gravity that had fallen upon her face was caused by the allusion in Mrs. Lennox's last words. She shook her head slightly and said, I don't recollect. Who is it? I remember you both came over on the same evening then, went on Mrs. Lennox, still without the slightest notion of returning a straightforward answer to Lucy's question. Mr. Meredith and you, don't you recollect now? Who? returned Lucy hastily, with dilated eyes fixed on her companion's face. Mr. Meredith. You surely are not speaking of him, said Lucy. Yes, I am, returned Mrs. Lennox composedly, not noticing the look of perfect horror in the girl's eyes. The fire had grown dull, however, and their faces in that dim light were not clear to each other's vision. You seem a little surprised, my dear, but you would not be if you had noticed all that I have done. I assure you that young man never comes to the house now but what I expect he will make Jeanie an offer. I want you to tell me if you know anything of his family and his prospects, and whether I am doing wisely in encouraging his attentions or not. Not a word of answer to this appeal came from the easy chair opposite to her. Lucy was sitting in a kind of trance of horror, which for the moment had almost stricken her dumb. She felt in her inmost heart that Mrs. Lennox was not deceived, and that what she said was perfectly true. Little fragments of doubt, which had found their way into her mind from time to time, hitherto crushed down and despised, all rose up in revolution in a moment, and formed a solid barricade of proof, against which hope dashed herself once and then dropped down dead forever. Mrs. Lennox, as it happened, had no time to feel surprised at Lucy's silence and apparent apathy concerning Jeanie's prospects in life, so different from her usual ready sympathy on all subjects brought before her by notice by either Mrs. Lennox or her daughter. Just at this moment there was a step in the hall, and a clear voice called out, "'Mamma, are you there? And where's Lucy? Has she come yet?' "'We're both here, Jeanie,' her mother answered, and then to Lucy in a lower tone. "'Another time, my dear. We'll finish our talk together quietly some day when there's no one by to interrupt us.' Jeanie came in, fresh and cold from the evening air, her shawl unfastened and drooping over her shoulders, her large garden hat in her hand. She went up to Lucy and offered her a pink cheek to kiss. "'You look very snug,' she said. "'Why didn't you send someone to fetch me in?' "'We did not know where you were,' said Mrs. Lennox. "'Nor who you might be with,' she added in rather a meaning tone. "'Oh, nonsense,' returned Jeanie, smiling a little to herself, as though she quite understood the illusion. "'We have not had any visitors now for two days. They were all at the concert.' Then to Lucy, with a slight hesitation, she added, Did, did Mr. Meredith sing? And was he encored? Lucy replied to both questions in the affirmative, but somehow not quite in her usual tone. 
I'm sure you're tired, said Jeanie compassionately, so I won't bother you now, but you must tell me all about it after dinner. I want to know what everyone wore, and which of the glees went off the best. Now I'm going to sit by your side and let you rest until you've had some tea. She curled herself on the hearth rug by the side of Lucy's chair, and kept silence meritously for some time. She little dreamt that Lucy, lying back so very still, was drawing a mental comparison between Jeanie and herself, and that the case, in her opinion, was decidedly in Jeanie's favour. Lucy Cunningham was not beautiful, as I have said before. She was merely a nice-looking girl, with a bright, intelligent expression. The only claims she could lay to beauty rested on her pretty rippling hair and round, graceful figure. But Jeanie was, in all respects, unusually pretty. Her little golden head gleamed in the firelight under Lucy's eyes. Her soft oval face, from the delicate eyebrows to the dimpled chin, Lucy knew by heart, and knew that it was very fair. The fault of Jeanie's face lay in the forehead, which was too high and not broad enough to please a critical eye, but Lucy did not think of this just then. She weighed herself and Jeanie in the balance and found herself wanting. She was utterly unconscious of one of her own greatest charms, perhaps the one of all others which had attracted Clinton towards her, her piquant, graceful manners. It was quite beyond Jeanie's power to keep silence very long. She soon began to talk again as eagerly as ever. She was wild to know everything that had happened the evening before, and especially all that concerned Clinton Meredith. But by this time Lucy had rallied her forces and could answer every question quite steadily. The extreme innocence and simplicity of both Jeanie and her mother rendered this much easier to her. She soon saw that there was no more likelihood of her secret being discovered by either of them than by two children. She told Jeanie everything she could remember about the concert, from the lace on Mrs. Pryor's dress and Arthur Westanley's attack of faintness, down to the flower in Clinton Meredith's buttonhole, and after a while the gentlemen, Lewis and Mr. Lennox, came in and they had dinner. End of chapter 15 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 16 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Dacre's Advice Liberavi Animam Meum During all the weary watches of the night which followed this memorable evening, Lucy little dreamt that only a few hours before, Clinton too had been weighing something in the balance, but not as she had done, alone. He asked advice and secured the assistance of a firmer hand than his own to hold the scales. The man to whom he applied was Dr. Dacre. It was partly owing to their being accidentally thrown together at a time when Clinton's mind had begun to grow uneasy as to the future, partly because Clinton had recognised, in a vague sort of fashion, that this other man was built of stronger, more reliable materials than himself, not that he would have admitted this, even to his own inner consciousness. He had the bump of self-esteem exceedingly well developed under his fair hair, and had by no means at that time made up his mind to regard Dacre as his superior, whatever other people might do. It happened that both Clinton and Dacre had some distance to ride home after the concert was over, and that for the greater part of the way their roads lay together, so they got their horses and started in company. For some time, both were very silent, Clinton even, now that the excitement of the evening was over, rather gloomy, but at last, riding along under the stars, in the soft hush of the night, his mood relaxed, and he felt an impulse to open his heart to his companion. Dacre, he said suddenly, when they had gone about two miles or so, Dacre, did it ever happen to you to come to a place where two roads met, and for the life of you you didn't know which to take? I mean by roads, courses of action, you know. Dacre glanced at him for a moment, somewhat surprised, and then, seeing that Clinton was really in earnest, he shook his head and said, No. After a moment he added, The two roads, yes. The doubt, no. One road was always plainly right and the other wrong. Ah, but I don't mean that, old fellow, said Clinton. You're on the wrong track. I don't mean a question of conscience, you know. But did you never see two roads before you, each equally easy to take, and for the life of you you didn't know which you'd rather go? Dacre laughed outright. No, he said, I never felt doubtful as to what I wanted in my life. I always saw that clearly enough. You were talking of an ombre de richesse such as I never experienced. Clinton was quite silent for some time after this. They halted their horses on the side of the hill they were ascending, and looked down on the lights of the town sparkling below them. At last Meredith said abruptly, the truth is, Dacre, I'm just now in a deadly dilemma. I must do one thing or the other, and I'll be hanged if I know which it's to be. He stared hard at the lights below in an absent manner as he spoke. Dacre, also with his eyes far away, answered, Why do you say this to me, Meredith? Do you want advice from me? I tell you plainly I can give you none, being as completely in the dark as I am. 
You say it's not a question of conscience, and if it's not, and you really don't know your own mind, why, so far as I can see, you might as well toss up for it and abide by heads or tails. They had turned their horses' heads and were riding on now. Well, no, there's no conscience in it, returned Clinton, ignoring the last suggestion entirely. He was half inclined to be affronted with Dacre for making it, and with the view of proving that his troubles arose entirely from his own superior powers of fascination, and were therefore matters for envy rather than otherwise, he rushed into particulars forthwith. You know Miss Cunningham, he went on. Well, we were engaged, at least after a fashion, you know. Hello, Dacre, don't go so fast, will you? It's a nasty bit of road just here. And so, as luck would have it, she insisted on introducing me to her friend, Jeanie Lennox. I held back, rather, but she would have it so, and... And she's very pretty, you know, and... I say, what am I to do, you know? Upon my word, old fellow, you'll have a cropper in a moment if you go on like that. Dacre's horse had stumbled on the slope of the hill as they descended. He was certainly riding rather recklessly at the time. If you want to come to grief, I certainly don't, Clinton went on. There, that's more the pace for such a hill as this. Breaking my neck isn't exactly the way I should choose out of my difficulties, though they're no end of a bore all the same. It has just come to this. One of these girls I suppose I must throw over. But which is it to be? Dacre muttered something between his teeth. He had not been entirely ignorant of all that Clinton was now imparting to him. The fact of Clinton's engagement to Lucy he had guessed long since on board the Flora MacDonald, but all this complication concerning Jeanie Lennox was quite new to him, and perfectly staggered him for the time. If Clinton had only known it, breaking his neck by following the other's lead was not the only risk he ran just at that moment. The man by his side, of whom he had been making a confidant, would have liked nothing better than to dismount and fight it out there and then, fair play on both sides and no favour. But after all, would it be fair play? Dacre's eye fell on Clinton's arm and shoulder as they rode abreast now, and he glanced down at his own broad chest. The contrast was too great, and after all, Clinton, in telling him this, had trusted him, and was speaking in good faith towards him at least. Dacre's decision came at last, slow and steady. You said it wasn't a question of conscience. I think it is, decidedly so. Which of these two girls has the first claim on you? Upon my honour I scarcely know, said Clinton, after a moment's hesitation. I've said more to Jeanie than I'd any business to, I know. But after all, Lucy has the first claim, I suppose. Then if you think that, and if you love her, and believe that you can make her happy, mind that, Meredith, I say, be loyal to the one who trusted you first. It's a hard matter to decide, but I see no other way out of it. Dacre spoke as though words were forced out of him against his consent, and he felt, when he had uttered them, somewhat as a man might do who had been compelled to sign his own death warrant. Clinton acquiesced on the instant. Dacre's stronger nature had for the time taken a firm grasp of his own, and he accepted the other man's decision without hesitation. There'll be some unpleasantness about it either way, he remarked, but Lucy certainly has the greatest right, and I'll go by what you say, Dacre. Here's the turning to Pryor's house. Good night, old fellow, and thanks for your good counsel. Dacre simply answered good night, and rode on. The iron hand with which he had been controlling himself relaxed, and he was breathing in quick gasps with his bright brown eyes on fire. He had ridden a mile or two before they began to cool, and then he suddenly exclaimed aloud, It was a hard matter, but, anyhow, I have been enabled to deliver my soul. The consequence of the conversation just related was that when Lucy walked into the dining room at Mongarewa after her ride home, the first object her eyes encountered was the figure of Clinton Meredith, seated in an easy chair near the window, with the light of the dying sun turning his fair hair and silky moustache to gold. End of chapter 16 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 17 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. A Question. If you love her best, speak out like a man. Lucy recoiled for a moment with an exclamation of surprise. Her next thought was that, in the whole course of her acquaintance with Clinton, she had never seen him look handsomer than he did then. The beautiful outlines of his face and head stood out magnificently, against the shadow gathering behind him in the corner of the room. Lucy took note of it all, with a curious sensation of wonder and perplexity as she did so. She had begun to learn the rudiments of a great lesson, to perceive dimly at last that all that glitters is not gold. Clinton had been expecting her for some time, and for his part was not in the least surprised or embarrassed. He rose to meet her with his usual air of caressing deference. He was apt occasionally to treat Jeanie with a little soft-spoken condescension, but Lucy, he had long since discovered, was a girl of a different calibre, and he liked her the better for it. 
Now, when he came forward to welcome her, however, he felt at once a change in her manner towards him. She held out her hand, but drew back a little at the same time, keeping him at arm's length, and when he took to caressing the little hand, that too deserted him, and Lucy turned away. Is anything the matter? Clinton asked involuntarily. No, she answered quietly, but I want to speak to you, please. Sit down again, Clinton. You looked very comfortable when I came in, and I'll warm my hands. The lamp was standing upon the table, but it was not yet lit. It was scarcely dusk enough for that. The sun still touched the posts of the veranda with his last rays, and outside the sky was all one splendour of red and gold. Lucy knelt down on the rug before the fire, and, taking off her riding gloves, held out her hands to the glowing wood embers in the grate, but in an absent fashion and with a strangely sober face. Something is up, thought Meredith as he watched her. When she turned towards him, still gravely, and asked, Clinton, how long is it since you were at Deep Dean? His countenance fell. Lucy noticed it, and without waiting for an answer to the first question, she went on. She's very pretty, isn't she, Clinton? And I suppose it was natural. Clinton turned scarlet. What on earth have you got into your silly little head now, he asked, with the poorest assumption possible of unconsciousness. You know what I mean, Lucy answered, looking at him steadily with eyes which he was accustomed to see soft and smiling, but which were now very grave. Don't try to keep it from me any longer, Clinton. I, I don't like it. I dare say you couldn't help caring most for Jeanie, but I wish you'd told me so honestly. I don't care most for Jeanie, he said, repeating her words, and all the more bent upon following Dacre's counsel, now that he began to have a faint inkling the decision might not be so completely in his power as he had imagined. You are equivocating, Lucy returned, but still quietly. You must see, Clinton, that I have found out the truth. Why do you try to deceive me still? I'm not equivocating or trying to deceive you, he said rather sulkily. Perhaps in your turn you'll tell me what you've found out, or fancy you've found out at all events. He thought he was conducting the matter with a masterly diplomacy. Once he could persuade her to bring any specific charge against him, he could deny everything and assume an injured role. But he was not prepared for Lucy's reply. Mrs. Lennox told me all about it, she said. And now, Clinton, I won't blame you. I'll try not to say another sharp word if you will answer me one question in all honesty. What is it? Honestly and truly, then, Clinton? Well, if I answer at all, of course it will be honestly, he replied, with an air of injured innocence. Do you think that Jeanie Lennox, on your honour, mind, cares for you or not? I want the plain truth, and what you tell me I shall believe. Clinton hesitated. She was so intensely in earnest that she was forcing him to be the same, and besides, in this case, the truth was flattering, and Clinton's ready vanity came into play at once. I believe she does, he said at last. There now, that's honest. And remember, you would have it. Lucy drew a long breath and was silent. Instead of the rose-flushed clouds outside on which her look was fixed, she saw, curiously blended together, Effie's dying eyes imploring her to take care of Jeanie, and again Jeanie's lovely round face, with the pathetic childlike expression it always assumed when she was thwarted, and with her beautiful blue eyes swimming in tears. At last she spoke again, very slowly and pausing between every few words. One of us two will have to give up, she said, and I expect it will have to be me. This was not at all what Clinton desired. He had resolved magnanimously to give up pretty Jeanie for Lucy's sake, and lo, his magnanimity was finding itself without ground to stand upon. No such thing, he exclaimed vehemently. Jeanie won't break her heart, and if she is a bit cut up, why, it's chiefly her own fault. She encouraged me to the end. I give you my word for that. But as for me, I shall do as I choose, and I choose you, Lucy. She sprang to her feet and turned on him almost fiercely. Don't try to lay the blame on her, whatever you do, she said. It's bad enough without that, Clinton. Clinton was betrayed into an involuntary expression of admiration. Upon my honour, he said, Jeanie's pretty, but her face can't light up like that, nor her eyes look so. I swear, Lucy, I'd rather have you than a dozen Jeanies. She stood before him, panting, with wrath in her face. A shadow came between her and the rose glory in the sky in front. It was a man passing through the veranda towards the door of the house, and Lucy recognised him in a moment. The next instant she threw open one of the long windows of the dining room, saying, Enter, Dr. Dacre. You are most welcome. Dacre came in. He had come in accordance with an invitation pressed upon him by Mr. Cunningham, who had taken a great fancy to him at first sight. He entered to find Lucy standing in one corner of the room, and Clinton in another, both flushed and excited. Between them lay one of Lucy's riding gauntlets, lying where she had accidentally dropped it, but looking like a gauge of battle. The first thing Dacre did was to stoop and take up the glove. He saw that something was the matter, and, knowing half, he guessed the rest. If the picking up of that glove had involved the acceptance of a veritable challenge, he could not have placed himself more decidedly by Lucy's side, 
or looked more ready to do battle on her behalf against all comers. Lucy, on her part, felt vaguely that here was a friend, and one who would take her part whenever called upon, for which she owed him some gratitude. Clinton, on the instant, experienced a sensation of the wildest jealousy, and knew at the same time that Lucy was lost to him forever. Truly at that moment both Lucy and Jeanie were revenged. And this was the situation of all parties when Mr. Cunningham came into the room. End of chapter 17. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 18 of Over the Hills and Far Away, a story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Clinton's First Love. Mr. Cunningham came in, fortunately, in high spirits, and was very cordial to both his guests. It was well he was disposed to be so sociable, for Lucy's conversational powers had entirely deserted her, and Clinton scarcely spoke a word. Dacre, however, threw himself into the breach. He took the seat at dinner next to Lucy, and contrived to cover her silence so dexterously by his own remarks that her father never even noticed it, and the girl was more grateful to him than ever. She thought, while he was speaking, that she had never before noticed the really remarkable beauty of his eyes. They were not soft eyes like Clinton's, but generally bright, keen, and rather sad. Still, they could deepen into softness, which was the more attractive, perhaps, from its rarity. They were, however, eyes gifted with the ability of expressing themselves, what they meant they could say, and say distinctly and forcibly. Therefore, they possessed that higher order of beauty which is not form or colour, and which outlasts, outrivals both. When Dacre rose to go, for he could not be persuaded to stay the night, his host pressed him eagerly to come again soon. "'Come as often as you can, Dacre,' Mr. Cunningham said. "'You will always be welcome, won't he, Lucy?' "'Yes,' returned Lucy, with one of her brightest smiles. And Dacre knew from her face that she was aware of how he had taken her part that evening, and he felt more than rewarded. Then she turned to Clinton, offering him her hand, and lowering her voice a little as she spoke. "'Good night,' she said, "'and good-bye. I am sorry I spoke crossly.' I shall tell Papa and Lewis that it was all my fault, so you need not mind about that, Mr. Meredith. She had called him Clinton for the last time, and he knew it. He answered her in the same tone. That is good of you, and I thank you for it, Lucy. I shan't call you that again, so never mind. I suppose it must be Jeanie, but it never would have been either of you if I hadn't seen the marriage of the only girl I ever really loved in the times, the day we spoke the flying foam. The words were so bitter that she did not at first believe they were true, she thought that Clinton was revenging himself on her thus. But he went out, saying to himself, Oh, Mary Lindsay, Mary Lindsay, why did you let me think you loved me, and then marry in three weeks after I had sailed? If I had been fickle and dishonest since, it is all your fault, and with you lies the blame. Clinton's boyish love, Mary Lindsay, will never enter this story, but what he had said to Lucy was almost the truth. He had loved his pretty, coquettish little cousin who lived at Madeira, but whom he had seen a great deal of during a visit of hers to England, as much as it was in his nature to love any earthly thing. He had never thought of Lucy Cunningham except as a lively, agreeable girl, whose society, pour passer le temps, was invaluable on board ship until the day he saw Mary's marriage in the Times. Then pride and wounded vanity were sore within him, and half from pique, half from genuine admiration for Lucy, he soon found himself making love to her in earnest, in earnest, at least, as far as Clinton understood the words. But though he had not been engaged to Lucy for a month before he had recognized her superiority to his boyish idol, he did not love her as he had done Mary. Lucy did not struggle for admiration, did not talk and act for effect like Mary had done. But still in Clinton's heart her image stood alone, distinct from all the other women whom he might admire, and whose favor he might still be eager to win on his way through life. Lucy did not know all this. How should she? If she had, she would not have tried to help on Clinton's engagement to Jeanie as she did. That she estimated herself at too low a value, and she did not believe that Clinton could be at heart indifferent to Jeanie. And if he loves her, she will be happy with him, Lucy thought. It was because I had not the power of gaining his love that he proved unfaithful to me. Her reasoning, though false, was not devoid of the grace of humility after all. So she used her influence with Mr. and Mrs. Lennox in Clinton's behalf, and pacified her father and Lewis, who never heard a correct version of what had passed. They knew, in fact, much less of it than Dacre did. But Mr. Cunningham had never liked Clinton, or been much in favour of bestowing his daughter upon him, and he was not sorry that, as he fancied, some childish dispute had arisen between them, which had terminated in the dissolution of their engagement. Clinton, for his part, was in no great hurry to bind himself afresh. He gave himself a month to think it over, and try how he liked his freedom. 
In all that time, he never once went near poor Jeanie. But at last, one fine day, he dressed himself carefully, and with the pleasing consciousness that he was looking his best, set off for Deep Dean. He found everyone out but the maid, who opened the door to him, and who was as fully persuaded as her mistress of the purport of his former frequent visits. She therefore volunteered the information that Miss Jeanie was somewhere about. Perhaps she had gone up the gully, or perhaps she was in the orchard. Clinton set off at once up the gully, hoping to find her there. But there was no sign of her at all to be discovered. He went on, however, until at last he reached the great stone, the scene of former meetings and flirtations, sweet because stolen. The sight stung him with the odd feeling of lost time. He had been with Jeanie there, and many times afterwards, when he might have been with Lucy. Now he could see Jeanie whenever he chose, but he could never have Lucy for a companion again. He felt as if he had better have made the most of her while it lay in his power. He set off again with this thought still in his mind, and did not lose it until he had closed the little gate which opened onto the gully behind him. Then he considered what he had better do next. Maggie had said something about the orchard, and there at all events he determined to look for Miss Lennox next. He did so, and was rewarded by a glimpse of the black skirt of Jeanie's dress between the boughs of a large apple tree. He walked round, and there she was, holding up with one hand her little holland apron full of fruit, with a great basket nearly filled with apples on the ground beside her. End of chapter 18. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 19 of Over the Hills and Far Away, a story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. The Beauty of Kent. When Jeanie saw him, she gave a start and a little cry, and let her apron fall so that all the apples it contained rolled out onto the ground. Clinton picked one up, an immense beauty of Kent, at his feet, and walked up to her, still holding it in his hand. "'I am afraid I startled you,' he said. "'Oh, no,' returned Jeanie, "'but I—I I did not expect to see you.' The loveliest rosy bloom had risen into her little round cheeks, but she drew herself up with a pretty assumption of dignity, and turned slightly away from him. The poor child was trying hard to be cold, and to keep him at a distance. She had not seen Clinton for some time, and had been imagining herself deserted. Twenty times a day she had resolved that if he came again she would give him such a lesson. And now here he was, as handsome as ever, and she knew she was looking pleased to see him. For a moment or two she could scarcely prevent herself from crying in her vexation. "'It seems very jolly here,' said Clinton. "'I'm glad I found you. Shall we sit down?' Jeanie made no answer to this, but she seated herself immediately. Between shyness and self-consciousness, if he had proposed to her to climb one of the apple trees and sit with him among the branches, she would scarcely have found words to refuse. Clinton sat down by her side, still nursing his beauty of Kent, and began by remarking that it was a long time since he had seen her. Very long, said Jeanie in reply, with an emphasis which came very near to being a sob. It shall never be so again, went on Clinton pointedly. At least if you don't forbid me to come, he added. All of a sudden, from something in his manner and the tone of his voice, it flashed upon Jeanie what was coming. She blushed rosier than ever, and down came the great tears in good earnest. After this it was all fair sailing. Clinton had only to put down his great yellow apple, ask her what was the matter, and kiss away her tears. Jeanie's poor little attempt at dignity had gone to the winds. I, I thought you were never coming again, she said. But you see I'm here, returned Clinton, your slave, at your feet. He never gave her any further explanation of his absence, and, having got him back again, she was quite satisfied. Once, just once, he could not help remembering the companion stairs of an emigrant ship on a certain rainy evening in the tropics, and someone very different to the present someone who had been beside him then. But the thought passed, and Jeanie's blue eyes, looking up into his with perfect innocence and truthfulness, never detected it at all. Very soon, Clinton was peeling Ribston Pippins for them both, and the whole thing was finally settled between them. Subject, of course, to the approval of Jeanie's parents, which, however, she had no fear would be withheld. She was as happy as possible, looking up to Clinton in everything, and taking for granted that all he did and said must be right. Clinton was a very poor hero, but he was a hero to Jeanie, after all. She darkly felt him great and wise, she dwelt on him with faithful eyes, I cannot understand, I love. It was the simplicity of the worshipper that formed the pedestal for the idol. The engagement of Miss Lennox to Mr. Meredith was soon made public, and very soon the whole district had discussed it. It was universally considered that such a handsome couple were well matched. The world does not comprehend the proverb Lucy had just been learning by heart. It takes everything that glitters for the precious metal. 
but just about this time one of Clinton's uncles died at home, and Clinton, as he expected, found himself the owner of a very comfortable sum to invest as he might find most advantageous. The match had become a very good one for Jeannie, in a worldly point of view, and it was settled that her marriage should take place in about six weeks, that is, in the early spring. Lucy received this piece of news one day when she had ridden over to Deepdean to keep Mrs. Lennox and Jeannie company during the absence of the head of the family. Mr. Lennox, Mr. Cunningham, Lewis, and Clinton had all journeyed into the next province to attend a great agricultural show, and they were not expected home for several days. Jeannie, for the first part of the evening after Lucy's arrival, was in the highest possible spirits. She had already thought over and settled her complete wedding toilet, down to the most minute items. A veil, of course, you know, dear, she said to Lucy, and some orange blossom in my hair. I think my dress shall be white silk with the tunic looped so. Won't it look lovely? And you, you know, Lucy, must be one of my bridesmaids. Would you rather wear white and blue or white and pink? I am not going to be a bridesmaid at all, said Lucy, shaking her head. Oh, you cross, darling, why not? inquired Jeanie anxiously. Lucy, having no answer ready, only said, wait and see, and Jeanie's mind was so full of a pearl set, which Clinton was going to have out for her from home, that she forgot to insist upon a more explicit reply. End of chapter 19. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 20 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Lucy's Ride. Jeanie could not eat any dinner that night, but she chatted incessantly and looked lovely with pink flushed cheeks and eyes even brighter than usual. When dinner was over, she went to the piano, but she could not sing. Her throat was sore, she said. At last, she sat down at Lucy's feet, laid her little yellow head on Lucy's lap, and subsided into silence. How hot her hand is, said Lucy to Mrs. Lennox. Jeanie, are you ill? Yes, I think I am, said Jeanie, sitting up suddenly. My throat's very bad, Mamma, and my head. I think I shall go to bed. The next day she was worse. She complained more and more of her throat. I am afraid it is diphtheria, said Mrs. Lennox, clasping her hands in her anxiety. And just now, when Mr. Lennox is away, whatever shall we do? Lucy stood in the centre of the dining room, considering. She, too, was feeling much alarmed. Perhaps Effie's recent death had made them all unusually ready to take fright at the sight of illness attacking Jeanie also. Clear before her mind was the necessity for obtaining medical advice without delay, and it so happened that at that time there was not a man upon the place. Business connected with the sheep had called both Mr. Hood, the manager, and all the available men to be had there away from the station for two whole days at the least, and to wait for their return was not to be thought of. Mrs. Lennox was half beside herself with terror and anxiety. Lucy soon saw that the decision of what to do, and how to do it, would rest entirely with her, and Jeanie's illness was increasing with alarming rapidity. "'Don't be so uneasy, dear Mrs. Lennox,' she said at last. "'But tell me at once, please, where is the nearest place that I can get a doctor?' Mrs. Lennox endeavoured to think. There were two doctors at the nearest town, but it was many miles away. All at once she remembered having heard that one of the doctors, reputed to be among the most skilful in the colony, was staying that very week with a friend on a large farm only about half as distant from Deepdean as was the town. Lucy's face cleared up immediately on hearing this announcement. Now, Mrs. Lennox, she said, you needn't fret any more. I shall have Dr. Thompson here in no time. You, said Mrs. Lennox in amazement, so astonished in fact that she immediately wiped away her tears. But it's over the hills. You could never find your way there, my dear. Yes, I can, and I shall too, returned Lucy. Robin Hood is just outside in the paddock, and I can catch him in no time. Come, Mrs. Lennox, don't cry any more, but help me to be off as fast as possible. She ran out of the room to slip on her habit and hat as she spoke. Mrs. Lennox followed her with some reluctance. She felt as though she were scarcely doing right in allowing her young guest to set off on such an adventurous expedition. Under ordinary circumstances, it would not, of course, have been allowable for a moment. But Jeanie's serious illness seemed to drown all lesser considerations, and people in the colonies must be prepared to put their shoulder to the wheel on an emergency. She followed Lucy out into the paddock, only stopping to take down her Holland sunbonnet on the way. After all, the poor little lady was only too glad to have someone think for her in this dilemma. It was her nature, like her daughter, to rely implicitly on the guidance of a clearer head than her own, and in this case Lucy's promptness of action scarcely gave her room to remonstrate, and in fact perfectly bewildered her. Still she knew, and the knowledge troubled her, that had the cases been reversed, not even for Lucy's sake would she have allowed her daughter to start upon such a lonely expedition. When Lucy had caught Robin and was ready, she went softly into Jeanie's room to have one look at her before starting. The girlish face, flushed with fever, 
was turned towards her as she opened the door. But Jeannie's eyes were closed, and she was either asleep or only half-conscious. Her satin hair, scarcely ruffled even then, was glistening in a radiant heap upon the pillow, just as she had swept it backwards from her face, and both her pretty white hands were thrown restlessly outside the quilt of the bed. Lucy drew back very quietly, without speaking to her, and closed the door again. On the toilet table, she had noticed a box of flowers and ribbons, which Jeannie had been trying on the day before. The thought of all her happy talk of the future, her plans for wedding veils and pearls and white silk dresses, smote Lucy with a sudden pang, if Clinton only knew what was happening in his absence. The thought sent her out of the room and down to the garden gate, where Mrs. Lennox was holding Robin with double alacrity if possible. When she had mounted, she stooped down, and, taking Mrs. Lennox's hand for a moment in her own, bade her keep up her courage and not fret. Perhaps Jeannie will sleep till I get back, she said, and I'll do my very best to send you advice before long. Then she forced herself to smile quite bravely and rode away, leaving Mrs. Lennox somewhat comforted to wait for the results of her expedition. As long as Lucy was on the plain, she rode fast. Had her route lain entirely over this long yellow sea, it would indeed have been easy, but after a few miles she was obliged to turn off onto the hills. Here, though her will was equally good, she was of necessity obliged to proceed more slowly, and with greater caution. Still, in spite of this, she was gaining ground very satisfactorily. She knew she was proceeding in the right direction, although she was afraid her want of knowledge of the country might add a few miles onto her course. One tussock-covered hill and gully are so very like all other tussock-covered hills and gullies to an inexperienced eye. She remembered now that on her way she must pass near to Lewis's station among the hills. Had he been at home, she would have ridden there immediately, but he had gone with his father to the agricultural show, and to ride to the station on the chance of finding someone there who knew the country and could do her errand would be a waste of time not for one moment to be thought of. At last, skirting the base of a hill, which hid from her within a few yards the faint track along which her course lay, Lucy was startled by a cooey from someone not far from her, but hidden from her sight by the hillside. The next instant there passed her a riderless horse with a lady's saddle on its back, and when the cooey was repeated, she recognised in the clear ringing tone a woman's voice. She shouted in reply, and the next instant she came in view of a lady in a riding habit, sitting on the ground before her with her hat lying at some little distance, and one great heavy coil of black hair falling over her shoulder. "'What is the matter?' inquired Lucy, riding up to her and recognising, with a start, her old shipmate, Mrs. Keith. "'Are you hurt?' Mrs. Keith, as she sat, looked up at Lucy with her great grey eyes, dilated with pain. "'It's my ankle,' she said. "'The creek looked so soft and boggy I got off to lead my horse, and somehow I've sprained my ankle. It's very bad.' She turned, if possible, a shade whiter even than before, and dropped down upon her side, and appeared, to Lucy's horrified eyes, to faint quite away. Lucy dismounted in a moment, fastened Robin Hood's bridle as well she could to a flax plant nearby, and ran to the creek for some water. She had nothing to carry it in except the palms of her hands. However, the few drops she managed to bring back revived Mrs. Keith, who was, in fact, in too much pain to remain long insensible. When she sat up again after her brief unconsciousness, her first action was an apparently involuntary movement of her hand towards her throat, covered as usual by a broad band of black velvet. Lucy mistook the gesture. "'Shall I unfasten it for you?' she asked. "'Perhaps then you would feel better.' "'No,' returned Mrs. Keith promptly. Then, as though to atone for her somewhat ungracious refusal, she added, "'I always wear it. It hides a scar. I was once bitten there by a dog, and the mark is an unsightly one.' Evidently, she was sensitive on the subject, and after this confession, uttered with manifest reluctance, she paused a moment. Then she added, "'What shall we do now?' "'Shall I try to catch your horse?' asked Lucy. "'I don't think you can,' returned the other doubtfully. "'Is there no house anywhere near here?' "'Yes, there is a station of my father's,' said Lucy. "'I think I had better help you on to my horse, and we will go there. "'They can send someone after yours, and then I shall lose no time in trying to catch it, for I have no time to waste today.' "'That will be much the best plan, certainly,' answered Mrs. Keith." if I can only mount. She gathered up her long hair in readiness for the attempt, and Lucy fetched her her hat. Robin was unfastened and stood quietly with his mouth full of grass, while Mrs. Keith managed with some difficulty to scramble into the saddle. Then they set off, Lucy holding up her habit with one hand, and with the other leading the horse. They had not far to go, fortunately, and soon saw the station lying before them at the entrance to a rather wide gully. A respectable-looking elderly woman, Lewis's housekeeper, came to the door to receive them. She was full of pity for Mrs. Keith's sprained ankle, and promised to send her husband as soon as he came home to his dinner in search of the runaway horse. Lewis's sitting room was a cheerful sunny room, and a regular bachelor's sanctum. A rifle and a revolver hung on one wall. A pair of spurs dangled beneath them, 
and on a small table lay a pile of newspapers smelling frightfully of tobacco, nor were stock whips and boxing gloves wanting. On each side of the fireplace was a shelf of handsomely bound volumes, Kingsley in blue, Macaulay in brown, Thackeray and Dickens in red, and a complete set of the Cornhill magazine in handsome bindings. In the centre of the mantelpiece, under a glass shade, was a Parian copy of the lovely bust of Clytie. It contrasted oddly and rather piquantly with some of its surroundings, but it gave the room an air of refinement which, but for that and the books and one other thing, would have been completely wanting to it. The other noticeable object was a picture. It hung just over Clytie in the centre of the wall above the fireplace, an oil painting without a frame. It was not particularly well painted, and was only half finished, the background being all cloudy daubs of paint. But out of the obscurity stood a head, a woman's head, pale and dark, and the picture had a strange kind of fascination about it because without title or motto, the artist had contrived to make the face suggest a story, the details of which each imagination could supply for itself. The great passionate eyes, the handsome scornful mouth, the slightly worn white cheeks brought out effectively by thick masses of dead black hair, all combined to make a decided impression upon Lucy. She was first oddly reminded of the poem she had been reading the night before. We were two sisters of one race. She was the fairest in the face. Oh, the evil was fair to see. Just the heroine for a story like that, Lucy thought, and then she half started, for it suddenly flashed upon her, as she was helping Mrs. Keith to limp across the room to the sofa, that the picture was not unlike that lady herself, bore, in fact, a decided resemblance to her. The mysterious painted head was really very like that of this equally mysterious lady. A mere coincidence, of course, she thought, but an odd one, for if this Mrs. Keith were ever to break her heart and grow utterly desperate, she would be the living duplicate of the picture on the wall. Who painted it, I wonder? and wherever did Lewis meet with it? But Lucy had no time to waste in conjectures. Now that the first emergency was over, she was in haste to set out again on her way. Mrs. Keith was seated on the sofa in comparative comfort, and was looking around her composedly, taking note of everything. She gazed so steadily at the face above the mantelpiece, that Lucy wondered if she detected the resemblance to herself. But she made no comment upon that or anything else, and received Lucy's explanation of whither she was going all so silently. Goodbye, said Lucy, holding out her hand. The other took it, hesitated a moment, and then asked, Will your brother be likely to return tonight? I do not think so, returned Lucy. He is not expected home until the end of the week. Then if my ankle continues painful, may I take the liberty of remaining here for the night? inquired Mrs. Keith. Certainly, said Lucy. I can answer for my brother that he will be glad for you to remain until you are better, and Mrs. Smith, I am sure, will make you as comfortable as she can. Thank you and she dropped Lucy's hand, which she had held during this short dialogue. Then suddenly she smiled, almost the first smile Lucy had ever seen upon her face, and repeated, Thank you. You have been very kind to me. I wish you good speed. Lucy flew to the garden gate, mounted Robin Hood in hot haste, and set off again at full speed. But all this had lost some time. Worse than that, it had taken Lucy out of the direct line of her course, and in trying to regain it she made a wrong turn, missed the gully she ought to have traversed, and went up the one she ought not to have done. The day was passing by rapidly. Her watch told her that, also the sun and her own growing fatigue, and at last it dawned upon her that she had mistaken her way. Lucy had a brave heart, a proof of that was that she was there at all. She braced herself up from the involuntary fit of terror which overcame her at the idea of being lost in these desolate hills, and endeavoured to set herself right once more. In vain. Robin Hood would canter in any direction she pleased, but she had not the slightest idea at last whether to turn him to the right or to the left. What would Jeanie do? For it was evident that the attempt to fetch a doctor that day would be a failure. And what would she herself do in solitude and night upon the hills? She had halted by a cluster of flax plants and a lagoon. On the hill above her a spectral-looking cabbage tree reared itself up in the light of the declining sun. The Maori heads in the lagoon had assumed their peculiar ghastly look in the shadow already beginning to thicken in the valley. They almost appeared to nod at her, with an awful derision, as dead tired and sick at heart she sat on her horse, looking round on the pale yellow solitude on all sides of her. Everywhere tussock grass and flax, and flax and another rolling sea of tussock. Everywhere except a speck, far off. Did it move? Is it coming nearer? Yes, no, yes, it is, yes it is, a horseman. End of chapter 20 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 21 of Over the Hills and Far Away, a story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Dacre to the Rescue. 
As he came nearer, Lucy thought she recognized him. Yes, surely she knew the broad square shoulders, the dark beard and moustache, and the bright brown eyes, gazing at her with unfeigned amazement from under the black felt hat. Of all men in the world, the one she would have chosen to encounter at that particular moment, had the choice been offered to her, for here was her errand accomplished, and herself delivered at one and the same instant. She cantered forwards to meet Dr. Dacre, and with a long breath, an expression of the most intense relief, she held out her hand. Oh, I am so glad I've met you, she said. Fancy, I had lost my way on the hills. Dacre took the little hand in his own, and privately thought himself a very lucky fellow. Were you afraid, he asked, holding her fingers in a firm grasp, which to Lucy, not yet recovered from her terror, spoke of comfort and protection, intensely soothing. I was, she answered, but I'm not afraid now. Dr. Dacre, you must please to come with me. I'll go with you anywhere you like on the face of the earth, said Dacre, and he meant it. Whatever should I have done if I had not met you, she remarked as much to herself as to him. I should have missed a great pleasure at any rate, Dacre answered. He had reluctantly come to the conclusion that it was time he released her hand. Even the circumstances under which he had encountered her, and her evident need of sympathy, would not justify him in retaining it any longer. He released her fingers, therefore, and when Lucy glanced at him again, she saw that he was looking steadily at a tuft of flax with his face a little turned away. She began telling him eagerly of Jeanie Lennox's illness, and of her own accidental delay from the accident to Mrs. Keith's ankle, and she thought that Dacre's manner grew graver and graver as he listened. It was certainly with a sigh that he told her he would look Mrs. Keith up the next day, but at present, of course, Miss Lennox's condition required his first attention, and, wondering a little at the sudden coldness of his manner, Lucy found herself riding by his side back to Deepdean. The coldness, however, did not last. Dacre's manner was almost as usual again when he turned towards her and asked her if she was not very tired. A little, she confessed, but it was of no consequence. She was anxious to get back to Jeanie. She is thinking more of her friend's comfort than of her own, said Dacre to himself, and Jeanie Lennox is what the world would call this girl's rival. It is not so long ago that I doubted if I should ever again meet a woman whom I could honour and respect from my heart, but I was wrong. It was a long ride. At last they reached the plain, and by this time it was quite dark. Lucy proposed that Dacre should ride on and leave her to follow slowly behind, but he scouted the idea so indignantly that she was almost amused, though grateful to him also for his care of her. At last they reached Deep Dean. Dacre lifted Lucy from her horse just as Mrs. Lennox ran joyfully out to meet them. Jeanie was no better, but then, on the other hand, she was no worse, and now that medical aid was secured, her mother was vastly relieved in her mind. Dacre went in at once to see his patient, while Lucy hastily changed her riding habit, and then went into the drawing room to wait for his opinion. Tired as she was, she was too restlessly eager for that even to sit down until she heard his step in the hall. He caught the appeal in her eyes as he came in and smiled. Miss Lennox's attack is not dangerous, he said. Set your mind at rest, she will be better tomorrow. The reaction from the anxiety she had been suffering was so great that the light grew dim and the room seemed to Lucy to swim round for a moment. She had followed Mrs. Keith's example that morning and fainted away. It seemed only a minute to her before she opened her eyes to find Dacre bathing her temples with water and Mrs. Lennox by her side in agonies of remorse and commiseration. It is all my fault, she said. That long ride has half killed her, poor dear. You didn't tell me I was to have two patients instead of one, said Dacre, as he saw her growing more like herself. And you won't have, she retorted. You haven't caught me for a patient yet. Don't flatter yourself. Don't pity me, Mrs. Lennox. I am all right again now. Dacre was smiling to himself at that moment in a manner which reassured Mrs. Lennox more than anything else. But no one had the least idea that by means of the tiny penknife attached to his watchguard, he had secured the identical round curl from Lucy's head which he had set his heart on ever since she had once offered it to him in a dream, a very boyish freak, and one quite unworthy of him, but which gave him some moments of happiness nevertheless. It occurred to Mrs. Lennox suddenly that both her guests must be half starved. It is indeed lucky, she said, that the dinner is just ready. I was afraid it would not have been, because the stove's got out of order. It always does when Mr. Lennox is away, and the leg of mutton wouldn't roast properly, but I think everything is ready at last. She led the way to the dining room, where a most comfortable repast was found to be awaiting them. To the two poor wanderers coming in out of the cold and darkness, the fire and light and food were truly inviting. Besides the leg of mutton, which had condescended to allow itself at last to be thoroughly done, there were bruised pakekas with plenty of bread sauce. They are excellent eating prepared in this manner, and some people prefer kakas, served on toast, to English pigeons. 
Lest my story should be pronounced too colonial in its language to be intelligible, I had perhaps better explain that pakekas are swamp hens, and kakas charming little grey parrots, with a few rosy feathers beneath their wings, but neither delicacy is always to be procured in the New Zealand of today. Who should drop in while they were at dinner but Arthur Winstanley? They made him join them, of course, immediately, with the ready hospitality of the colonies, and Lucy was really glad to see him, for with her he was rather a favourite. When she told him of her expedition that day, he regretted with real earnestness that he had not come over the evening before, as he had once intended to do, so that he might have saved her all her trouble. Lucy gave him credit for being perfectly sincere in what he said, but she was not in the least deceived by it, as Mrs. Pryor was. She saw that he did truly like and respect her, but she felt instinctively that, if he had ever been in love, he must have shown it in a far different fashion. Whatever the reason may be, she said to herself one day, it is evident that he is a man who prefers the society of those women who will allow him to be a friend, without ever suspecting him of a wish to be anything more. So she continued to be very civil and kind to him, in a perfectly open, unconstrained fashion, and he, in his turn, plainly showed that he preferred Miss Cunningham to anyone else in whose company he ever found himself. Tonight Dacre and Arthur Winstanley seemed to meet with a slight constraint on both sides. It was explained, however, when Dacre, after a little desultory conversation, said quietly, I dare say, Winstanley, you won't mind my telling you now that I remember you perfectly. We won't say anything more about it, but let bygones be bygones. But of course I always saw that you were a gentleman, and I never really believed that your name was Smith. A faint tinge of colour came out on Arthur's cheek. I should prefer to say no more about it, he replied with a glance at Lucy. All right, returned Dacre, and the subject dropped at once. But Lucy, being of course devoured by feminine curiosity, attacked Dacre on the subject the very first time that Arthur Winstanley was out of the room. It is not much to tell, Dacre said. Winstanley was one of the troopers in the regiment to which I was surgeon. He called himself John Smith. I suppose he had got into trouble of some sort and enlisted. When I saw him first at the concert the other night, I felt sure I recollected him, but I could not recall under what name. End of chapter 21 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 22 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. The First Time. Dr. Dacre was right. The next day Jeanie was better, and all seemed in a fair way to go on comfortably once more. Dacre got his horse and disappeared soon after breakfast. Lucy fancied that he had gone, as he said he would the day before, to see how Mrs. Keith's injured foot was progressing, and in this conjecture she was quite right. What on earth can have brought Laura into this part of the country, he muttered to himself as he mounted and rode away. Her brother's station is eighty miles away. She was at that concert with him and her sister, and I suppose she has been living with them since she landed. His thoughts did not dwell upon her long, however, nor did he trouble himself to ride at all quickly in the direction where he expected to find her. He let the reins fall on his horse's neck, and, taking out his pocket book, extracted from its deepest, safest corner a small round lock of hair, which he held up in the sunlight while he wondered to himself if Lucy had yet missed it, and, supposing that she did, if she would for one moment suspect where it had gone. At last, not far from the same part of the track where Lucy had the day before encountered Mrs. Keith's horse, that is, where the path took a sudden turn, he roused himself from his musings, gathered up his rein, and cantered round the curve of the hill. This brought him out face to face with another rider, a figure well known to him. Laura herself, exclaimed Dacre. She was riding very slowly, and without a stirrup, as her sprained foot would not yet bear it. Her riding habit was black, and she wore a black felt hat, with a large curled black feather. Nothing relieved the sombre dress except the pointed linen collar beneath the velvet round her neck, her white gauntlets, and the bunch of trinkets dangling and glittering at the end of her short gold watch chain. Conspicuous among them were two rings, one plain and one set with three turquoises. Altogether she looked, in costume and manner, not like the Laura of the concert, but like the Mrs. Keith who had often paced the deck of the Flora MacDonald on a calm moonlight evening. Dacre's hand went mechanically to his hat as he approached her, but he recollected himself and the salute was never completed. For her part, she took no notice of him whatever. It really appeared as though she would have passed him within a few yards, without the slightest acknowledgement that she was aware of his presence, if he had not placed himself directly in her way and stopped her further progress. "'I hear that you have hurt your ankle,' he said. "'I have come to see if the injury was in any manner serious.' 
Extraordinary condescension, she replied, with the utmost scorn in her voice and expression. Do you really suppose you could do any good? Dacre must have been a good-tempered man, for he kept his temper now. I heard that you had sprained your ankle too badly to allow of your leaving Mr. Cunningham's station, he answered, and, feeling sure that it must be unpleasant to you to be dependent upon the kindness of strangers, I was going to endeavour to help you. However disagreeable to myself to be brought once more into your society, yet conscience ordered me to act towards you as I would to any other human being whom I had known to be in the same circumstances. Your conscience, she said beneath her breath, with intense bitterness. Dacre did not appear to hear. I will get off and examine your foot now, he went on. You will do nothing of the kind, she said sharply. You refuse to allow me? I do. Then I have only to say, good morning. He had turned his horse's head and was actually leaving her as he spoke, but she called him back. Stay a moment, she said. Who told you of my accident? He hesitated before replying, and suddenly a flush of fire rose into Laura's cheeks and her great eyes glowed. I know, she said. It was Miss Cunningham. Ah, what a pity it is that my unworthy self stands in the way. She repeated the words twice over with a fierce little laugh of triumph, which made her face for the moment an unpleasant one to contemplate. Dacre's blood was getting up now. His straight, strongly marked eyebrows contracted, and his whole face hardened. It was like the rising of a storm. Suddenly he gave a great sigh and his brows relaxed. Only a woman, he said, after all. But oh, the infinite contempt of the words. So might a man have spoken who, driven into a moment's fury by an insect's sting, reflects, only a gnat after all, not worth a grain of the passion I am wasting on it. Something, however, in his look, underlying the anger and contempt, told Laura that her chance shot had gone even nearer to the mark than she expected. She pursued the theme, therefore, with a complacency that was almost remarkable, and becoming peculiarly calm and sweet in her manner, after the fashion of some women when they intend to give utterance to anything especially spiteful. A great pity indeed, she said once more, but unfortunately I fear I am too substantial an obstacle to be evaded. Even my late accident is not a dangerous one, though upon the whole I think it is more prudent not to place the case under your medical care. May I trouble you to give a message from me to Miss Cunningham? Pray tell her I am sorry for her sake she came up when she did yesterday, and showed me so much attention. Perhaps a night's exposure to the weather and the pain of my sprain unrelieved might have inflicted some injury upon my constitution, but try not to mind for perhaps you may have better luck next time. It was all uttered in the softest tone and with the most charming smile in the world. As she spoke, one hand was playing with the trinkets on her watch chain, making the two rings glitter as they caught the sunlight, and of course attracting Dacre's attention towards them, which was perhaps what she intended. He waited quietly, and allowed her to say her say out. He never attempted to stem the current of bitterness and spite she was displaying. Perhaps he knew her of old, and knew that it would be of no use. At all events, it is but fair to say that all through their interview, his conduct had shown to great advantage by the side of that of the lady, shall we still call her so, whom we have hitherto known as Mrs. Keith. At last, when she had relapsed into silence, partly from want of breath, Dacre said, it will be a long time before I carry a message from you to Miss Cunningham, and perhaps now you will allow me to inquire in my turn, what has become of Captain Rollo? He thought that the taunt would have stung her into fury. Strange enough, it did not. It rebounded, leaving her perfectly cold and calm. The arrow seemed in some manner to have missed its mark. Captain Rollo, she said thoughtfully, and then, I think our interview has lasted quite long enough to annoy us both sufficiently. Let us bring it to a close. With all my heart, said Dacre. Probably we shall not meet again, she added. My brother, Augusta, and myself are leaving the country for England via Melbourne in about a month, so farewell. Farewell, returned Dacre. Am I to pay your passage? She hesitated, evidently longing to say no, but the offer must have been a tempting one, for after a moment's struggle with herself, she bent her head and said, Yes, but not one word of thanks. I will send you a cheque, he returned, and then they parted, Dacre turning his horse's head back to Deep Dean. Laura pursued her way as before, at a walking pace. The horse on which she was mounted was a very quiet animal, or with her injured ankle she could not have ridden it at all. It was a fair, soft, sunny morning in early spring. There was nothing to attract her attention in the scenery around her. She rode with her eyes on her horse's ears, letting the reins drop on his neck, and suffering herself to become engrossed in her own thoughts. The money is a good thing, so her meditations ran on, but the revenge is a better. Have I wounded him at last? After all, I think I grow a little weary of this too. I think I am growing tired of all things and people, except one. Lucy Cunningham has a sweet face, I confess, and there is something about her which I suppose people would call lovable. 
She was very willing to give up her horse to me when I was hurt, and her hands were very gentle when she touched my foot. They tell me Arthur admires her. What do I care? That does not trouble me at all. What does trouble me is, sometimes, old memories, faded ghosts of Beatrice long ago, when we were all fresh, innocent girls together. Beatrice. Now I suppose in England it is night. I wonder if the moon is shining on that grave at Brighton. End of chapter 22 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 23 of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Lewis loses his temper at croquet. The hill behind Maungarewa was steep and strewn with boulders, as has before been mentioned in the course of this story. Steep as it was, however, on one hot afternoon in the early summer, Lucy set forth valiantly to ascend to the summit. Halting more than once to rest and pant in the great heat, and with a feeling of considerable pride in her own exertions, she at last found herself at the top. From the point where she was standing, the road by which Mongarewa was usually approached was visible to some distance. In fact, two roads were commanded from this position. One of them, the longest but the easiest, skirted the base of the hill, and swept round to the house. It was the road par excellence. The other, a much shorter way, led straight over the summit of the hill itself, but it had the drawback of far rougher ground, and the steep descent. It was usually only attempted by masculine riders. Mr. Cunningham and Lewis invariably approached the house this way. So did those of their friends who preferred riding across country to the beaten track, but ladies seldom ventured on it. At this moment, Lucy, standing quite at the top of the hill, leaning against a huge grey rock, was eagerly scanning the road beneath. At last, the object of her watch became apparent in the form of a couple of riders, a lady and a gentleman, advancing in the direction of Maungarewa. It was Mr. and Mrs. Meredith. During the spring, Clinton and Jeanie had been married. They had been to Auckland for their wedding tour, and they had come back and settled down in a composed fashion on some land which Clinton had purchased, not very far from Maungarewa. Today there was a game of croquet in prospect, and as it was a novelty to Jeanie, she was wild with delighted anticipation. Lucy imagined that she had climbed to the summit of the hill to look out for her two guests. Nevertheless, after she had discerned their figures quite distinctly beneath, her eyes still turned towards the distant road with an eager, unsatisfied expression. At last, cresting the spur of a hill far away, appeared another horse and rider, following almost in the track of the other two, but at some distance behind them. Lucy saw and smiled. Reaching the point where the road branched off towards the hill, Clinton and Jeanie paused a moment. Evidently they conferred a little, and then decided that it would not do. They presently set off again, still keeping to the regular path. The other rider came up at a canter, and dashed off the road and up the hill, almost in a straight line to where Lucy was standing. Like the prince in the German fairy stories, he was in too great a hurry to reach the princess to look what the road was made of under his feet, and as the princess happened to be watching him at the time, the attention was very gratifying to her. He did not see her at first, and when he at last made out her pale grey dress, almost the colour of the rocks themselves, she was just turning to fly down the hill on the other side. I shall be too late to receive them, she said to herself, as she darted down the rocky slope as fast as the ground would allow her. Nevertheless, Dacre overtook her before she reached the house. He had become a very frequent visitor at Mangarewa. Mr. Cunningham had taken an immense fancy to him, which only increased as time went by. Unlimited invitations and inclination to match brought Dacre to Mangarewa again and again. Did he see what he was drifting towards? At first, certainly not. He had started with the idea that Lucy had cared too much for Clinton Meredith ever to be in any danger from himself, that for her there was no fear, and that he had only his own peace of mind to look forward to. The present was temptingly sweet. Pain must follow, that he knew. But he put it off, the inevitable suffering, which stared him grimly in the face at times, put it off from day to day, and time flew by, and while he lingered here, reaching after an impossible paradise, the night was coming wherein no man can work. Dacre had been much loved by the people with whom the course of his life had brought him in contact. He had no near kith and kin, but the officers in his regiment years ago had, one and all, liked Dacre, and afterwards, when he had left the army, and devoted himself to sanitary work in one of the large English towns, where such work was sorely needed, he made for himself a place in some hearts which never forgot him afterwards. He had been a wealthy man all his life, and he had done much good with his money, such good as can never be forgotten, for the record of it is on high. 
But after this testimony in honour of Rilston Dacre, it cannot be denied that at this time he was most assuredly in the wrong, and it does not make that wrong less that he was destined to a bitter repentance later on. Lewis happened to be at Maungarewa that afternoon, so their croquet party was complete. They took their balls and mallets and marched down to the bottom of the garden, where there was a level space of lawn suitable for carrying on the game. Jeanie was in a flutter of delight and excitement, as pretty as ever in her blue silk dress and coquettish little sailor's hat. Mrs. Meredith was just as childish, as light-hearted and good-humoured as Miss Lennox had been. Clinton, too, was quite unaltered. When Lucy asked him to come with her and help her to arrange the wires, he told her she had only to command him, with a look out of his blue eyes such as she remembered of old. It did not mean very much. Clinton was fond of his pretty little wife, and was very kind to her, but he could no more help trying the power of his handsome eyes on Lucy than he could have helped eating his dinner when it was served up hot before him. Lucy returned his look very quietly and steadily, with something lurking in the depths of her eyes which was very like disdain, but the next moment that changed to amusement, and she smiled to herself. Is it possible that this man ever had any power over me, she thought? How small and shallow and weak he seems to me now, by the side of someone else. Lucy and Dacre had practised croquet so much together lately that they had become by far the best players among the company collected at Maungarewa that afternoon. Clinton and Jeanie were mere beginners, and Lewis, though tolerably skilful, was not equal to his sister. But Lewis's odd and unaccountable dislike to Dacre, which had originated long ago on board the Flora MacDonald, was still in full force. He utterly disapproved of the frequency of Dacre's visits at Maungarewa, and though he had joined the croquet party today to please his sister, it was under protest, and he would not play on Dacre's side. Lucy found this out almost immediately, and to cover it she proposed that Lewis and herself should play against their three guests. It seemed on the whole a tolerably just division of talent. One game was got through in this manner, then Lewis declared himself dead beat with the heat, and said he would look on while the others continued to play. The two ladies, therefore, challenged the two gentlemen, and soon found that they had met with more than their match. Jeanie was intensely anxious to win, but her husband was more expert than herself, and Lucy found that she could not hold her own against Dacre. At last there came a time when Dacre had his two fair antagonists at his mercy. As he made ready to croquet Lucy's ball, she said involuntarily under her breath, as you are strong, be merciful. Dacre, looking up into her eyes, answered in the same tone, I won't hurt you, and straightway knocked her ball into a rather more advantageous position than it had before occupied. But the next instant he sent Jeanie's ball flying far and wide. Lewis, watching, had seen it all. He knew that Dacre had said something to his sister, although he was not near enough to catch the words, and he saw that Dacre's awkwardness was assumed. He got up from where he was seated with wrath in his heart and walked towards them. Your skill appears to desert you sometimes, Dacre, he said. That was a very bad stroke you made just now. I suppose I was nervous, was the answer. Lucy was so amused at the extreme coolness and promptness of the reply, and at the idea of Dr. Dacre, one of the most self-possessed of men, being attacked with a sudden fit of nervousness, that she was obliged to turn away to stifle a laugh. Lewis saw it, and the cup of his wrath was full. He stood looking on for a few moments longer with a gloomy brow, and then walked away towards the house, leaving the others to continue playing or not as they chose. Straight into the drawing room he marched, and there he found his father lying stretched out on the sofa, reading the newspaper, with a glass of claret on the table by his side. Hot, isn't it? said Mr. Cunningham. How on earth those gals can play croquet in this weather I cannot imagine. Help yourself to some claret, old fellow, and pass me the decanter. Lewis did as he was desired, and drank his claret in moody silence. Mr. Cunningham had retired into the columns of the newspaper. Stillness reigned supreme. All at once the clear ring of a peal of girlish laughter from the bottom of the lawn came floating in through the open windows. Lewis dashed his tumbler down onto the table by his side. Really, he said, this will have to be put a stop to. What will? inquired Mr. Cunningham, opening his eyes in amazement as well he might. This croquet playing, Lewis went on still more hotly. These visits. He's always here, day and night. I say it shan't go on. You seem in no end of a heat about something, said his father. What is in the wind, I should like to know. In the wind, repeated Lewis. Why this? that if you don't take care, you'll have Lucy marrying him before your very eyes. What if she did, retorted Mr. Cunningham, all the opposition of his nature fairly roused by his son's manner. It would be a great deal better than marrying him any other way at any rate. Then in a moment he added scornfully, Talk sense, will you have the goodness? Who are you speaking of her marrying? Dacre? Lewis assented with a kind of bitter growl. 
Well, said Mr. Cunningham reflectively, she might do far worse. In fact, I don't think I'm sorry. Dacre's a thoroughly good, manly fellow, and a gentleman. Upon the whole, I don't mind giving my consent on the spot. Now, at the bottom of Lewis's heart, there was a secret conviction that his father was in the right. Dacre was a good fellow and a gentleman, and Lewis knew it, however he might choose to deny the facts. He ignored the knowledge utterly, but there it was, and he could not shut his eyes to it entirely. He had been forced to yield Dacre a sort of reluctant admiration in trifles ever since he had discovered what a much better shot and more skilful swimmer this other man was to himself, but he would not have owned to the existence of one redeeming trait in the man to whom he appeared to feel such a groundless aversion. However, the decided manner in which his father had spoken left no hope in that quarter. What was to be would be, Lewis could not hinder it. He said no more, therefore, but sat and sipped his claret and looked out of the window with a gloomy face. I know you don't like Dacre, resumed Mr. Cunningham, after a few moments spent in studying his son's countenance. What is the reason, Lewis? This was just what Lewis did not wish to explain. He took refuge in a convenient form of evasion. I don't mean to say anything against him, Lewis said. Only I don't much care to have him for a brother, I confess. He hasn't asked her yet, though, so perhaps our conversation is a little premature. Let us drop the subject. With all my heart, returned Mr. Cunningham, more especially as I didn't start it. There was another silence, during which the croquet players, having finished their game, were heard coming up the lawn. They came in, both the girls laughing and flushed with the heat, and exchanging chaff with their cavaliers concerning the game just concluded. Jeanie carried a small basket full of ripe strawberries from the garden, and Lucy went out of the room and fetched little china plates and spoons, with cream and sugar and cut glass dishes. A dainty little repast was soon improvised, with another bottle of claret for the gentleman. Lewis would not condescend to partake. He chafed inwardly to see how Dacre had managed to put the best strawberries onto Lucy's plate, and to give her the richest spoonfuls of the scalded cream. "'The show of fruit this year is perfectly wretched,' he remarked at last, in a snappish kind of tone. "'Not in my garden,' retorted Mr. Cunningham immediately, with a counter-snap. "'Certainly not in the way of strawberries,' put in Dacre, with one in his hand, and clenching the last nail on the head. "'Of course, if you all choose to contradict me, I had better shut up at once,' replied Lewis, with a deeply injured air. Jeanie looked at him with round, wondering eyes. "'No one contradicted you, Mr. Lewis,' she said. "'I'm sure I didn't, for the very sweetest little cherry tree in my garden, with such blossoms, has been blighted this year by the frost.' "'Never mind, Jeanie,' said Clinton consolingly. "'I'll get you lots of cherries from Pryor. "'He has more than he knows what to do with.' "'There was some new music lying on the piano, "'some songs of Clarabelle's and a few of Arthur Sullivan's. "'Lewis walked across the room and began turning it over, "'with now and then a contemptuous expression "'at something in the notes or the words. "'Dacre was looking at a volume of the graphic "'which lay upon the drawing-room table. "'How good these American sketches are,' he said to Lucy. Excellent, replied Lucy, getting up to look at one of them over his shoulder. Couldn't we set up a sketching excursion, he went on. There are some pretty bits near the bridge you have not tried yet. Lewis immediately interposed. You know you can't do anything of the kind, Lucy, he said crossly. Robin Hood is perfectly lame. This was too much even for his sister's good temper. Robin is quite better, Lewis, she said very coldly. He was only lame for two days last week from a little strain he got in the creek. Then, turning to Dacre, she added... Let's get up the expedition by all means, but I think we will arrange the details another time. Altogether, the evening did not pass off as harmoniously as usual, and the disturbing element was felt by all to be Lewis Cunningham's unaccountable ill temper. End of chapter 23. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 24 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. The Second Time. That summer was very hot, and Mrs. Pryor felt the close, oppressive weather severely. She was lying on a couch in her drawing room, looking as majestic as ever in a gold-coloured lustre costume, which suited her dark hair and brunette complexion admirably. I never felt so utterly exhausted in my life, she remarked to her husband, who was seated by the table, looking over some accounts, and much too busy with the long columns of figures to pay any attention to what she was saying. Not meeting with any response or sympathy, Mrs. Pryor was silent for a time. She even, I think, indulged in a slight doze, but some unusual sound aroused her at last, and she exclaimed with less than her usual dignity, Well, really, there is actually Arthur leading his horse to the door. 
wherever can he be going to on such a blazing afternoon? When Arthur himself appeared soon after in the drawing room, booted and spurred, and requested his sister to put a fresh puggery on his hat, she made the same inquiry again. But her curiosity was doomed to remain unsatisfied, and she did not succeed in obtaining any satisfactory reply from him. I have a little business to see after at some distance, he said, and I shall probably not be back till the day after tomorrow. To sell a horse, did you say? Oh yes, that or anything else you like. Hot? Yes, I know it is, but business won't wait. Now that you've put this white concern on my hat, I shan't take the least harm. With which words he quietly walked out of the room, and in ten minutes was riding out of the paddock and away westwards. His business was, as he had told Mrs. Pryor, at some distance apparently, that night he slept at a hotel by the banks of a river, which he crossed the next morning. Gentlemen in the colonies do not usually take much luggage with them on such journeys as this. A mackintosh, a toothbrush, and a pocket handkerchief comprised the larger half of Arthur Wistanley's impedimenta. Besides these, he had in one pocket a minute portable brush and comb, and in another a clean linen collar, far too great a nuisance to be tolerated when alone in the heat, but carefully reserved to complete his toilet at a fitting moment. When he set off on the second morning, the character of the scenery in which he found himself had quite changed. He had now got into the region of bush and ferns, both very scarce around Deep Dean Mongorewa. At last he came in sight of a station on the outskirts of the bush, an irregularly built house with a veranda deserving of no especial description. In front there was a square space of English grass, shut in on all four sides by trees. You entered it by a natural avenue of trees and a gate and some pretty green rails at one end. The house, thus enclosed, had a peculiarly quiet, secluded appearance. You might have passed it quite close and not have known that it was there. It lay basking in the sunshine with no signs of life about it in front. Had it been of larger, more pretentious appearance, it might have served an artist for a drawing of the palace of the sleeping beauty in the wood. The garden as it was, however, was decidedly the most striking characteristic it possessed. It lay at the side of the house and was entered by a small white gate at the corner. It was remarkable because, having once been well stocked and then neglected for some time, it had become a truly magnificent wilderness of roses and honeysuckles. Approaching the house, and before emerging from the sheltering shadow of the trees, Arthur Winstanley put on his collar, and made his toilet as complete as was possible under the circumstances. This argued that he expected soon to find himself in the presence of ladies. In this supposition he proved to be perfectly correct, for he had scarcely entered upon the slope of English grass in front of the house before a woman's figure glided out of the principal door before him, and proceeded towards the white gate at the side of the garden. We cannot fail to recognise her as soon as we observe that she is dressed in black, and wears a black velvet band round her neck. Arthur, too, knew her immediately, and, raising his hat, got off his horse, fastened it to the fence, and walked up to her. She was evidently taken by surprise to see him, and was not expecting him just then in the least. She had a great garden hat on her head, and in one hand a small basket and a pair of scissors. Her other hand was on the latch of the garden gate, and she stood swinging the little gate backwards and forwards with an unconscious gesture, arrested on her way to cut her flowers, and, at first, not too well pleased apparently at the interruption. All traces of annoyance, however, she had managed to banish from her face by the time he came up to her, and she shook hands with Arthur with well-acted cordiality. What a hot day, is it not? she said as she greeted him. I suppose you have ridden some distance. Pray come in, your horse shall be looked after, and I will order some luncheon for you. But I fear you must be contented with only me for your hostess today, for Augusta is lying down with a bad headache, and my brother is away from home. Considering that his business lay entirely with herself, Arthur thought that things had fallen out rather conveniently than otherwise, but he was a man of few words. He simply replied, thank you, and followed her into the house. The room into which she led him was of a good size and comfortably furnished. There were several watercolour sketches on the walls in plain gilt frames. All of them were views on the South Devon coast. The Dawlish Bay by moonlight, a view from Plymouth Hoe, and a study of the Bolt Head were the three largest of them. The rest were small and less finished in execution, but all were well painted and brought back that lovely coast scenery to Arthur in a moment. Perhaps he saw it sparkling with the light of other days, for he quite held his breath as he entered the room. I see you are recognising the old places, remarked Laura as she followed the direction of his eyes. How I do long myself sometimes to see that exquisite colouring again, to stand once more on the dear old bolt with my eyes on the glorious blue sea beneath. So do I, said Arthur, with unmistakable sincerity. Would you not like to go home, she asked him suddenly, with an abruptness which seemed quite to startle him for a moment. Why do you ask, he answered coldly, and with a curious steady look at her as he spoke. She coloured a little and gave a faint sigh. 
We won't talk about it now, she said. You shall get some luncheon first, and then I have a plan in my head to propose to you, but we will go out and discuss it in the garden. These wooden walls have ears, but my roses have not. A servant came in with some cold meat and bread and butter on a tray, and Laura herself fetched in a decanter of sherry and a glass. Arthur was really very hungry, and ate what was placed before him with a good appetite, his hostess sitting quietly meanwhile by the window at the farther end of the room. No one disturbed them during this time, and when he had finished they went together to the garden as Laura had proposed. It was in its way a lovely garden. As they paced down the walks they could not avoid at times treading upon the lovely perfumed blossoms which stretched themselves far over the borders of their appointed flower beds onto the grassy vistas between. At their side the roses and honeysuckles had caught the trunks of the trees and clung to them, flinging delicate sprays high up into the branches, and with the sunshine streaming through the leaves, forming an exquisite tapestry of pink and green and gold. The two dark figures passed and repassed between the sunlight and the shadow against the brilliant background for at least an hour. Then they once more approached the little white gate together and leaned over it for a few moments to exchange a parting word or two. Whatever excitement either of them might have passed through during that hour, and however fierce the argument which had previously raged, all was now over, and both were quite outwardly calm and courteous. As they reached the gate, Arthur was inquiring after another sister of Laura's. "'What has become of Nora?' he asked. "'She was the plainest of you all, I know, and not the same style of girl at all as you others, who were all so much alike, but I used to admire Nora, and respect her too, in spite of that.' "'She has turned out the best of us,' Laura answered. She has married a clergyman in England. Nora is a good woman, and I wish I were more like her. She ended her words with an involuntary sigh. What did Nora think of Captain Rollo? Arthur asked suddenly, watching her keenly while he spoke. Laura gave a violent start. It was the name which Dacre had taunted her with the day he met her riding on the hills. The second time, she thought, that this insignificant forgotten name has risen out of the past. What does this mean? Captain Rollo, she repeated slowly. Yes, you remember Rollo, don't you? Arthur went on quietly. A fellow with curly black hair who kept hunters and did not sing badly. You ought to remember him, Laura, for he was a great admirer of yours. Something in his words, was it a touch of irony in their tone, sent a hot colour up to the roots of her hair. Dacre had once said of her, she never looked so ugly as when she blushed, and it was true. Ah, yes, she said, I remember him now. After this, nothing further passed between Arthur Winstanley and his companion. They simply said goodbye and separated. Just as Arthur was mounting his horse, which a man had brought round from the stables, Laura called out, Remember your promise. And he replied, I shall not forget. But do you, on your part, remember the conditions of the agreement? When he had ridden quite out of sight, Laura still stood where he had left her, leaning over the little white gate. Her tall black figure served as a foil to bring out more vividly the lavish wealth of colour in the background. A wattle, growing by the gate, bent its beautiful green feathery sprays over one of her shoulders, and on the other side of her was a bush of gorse, all one blaze of coconut-scented gold. She stood, a sombre shadow, between the two. Her face, to any one who studied it narrowly, was always a very sad one. There was about it no peace, none of the strength born of inward rest. It was a very handsome face, and a very expressive one, but always in its passionate love, anger, or grief, very mournful in its one blank want. The face of one tossing on the dark ocean of this life, who has not yet sighted land ahead. The day on which Arthur Winstanley again reached home was much cooler than that on which he had started upon his mysterious expedition. There was, in fact, a fresh, strong breeze from the north. Consequently, Mrs. Pryor was enabled to throw much more energy into her inquiries as to where he had been and what he had been doing during his absence. But his replies still left her curiosity unsatisfied. All he condescended to inform her was that he was growing perfectly weary of living in her house with nothing definite to do, and had fully made up his mind to leave for home by the next San Francisco mail, or, at all events, the next but one. Mrs. Pryor immediately jumped to the conclusion that he had been to propose to Lucy Cunningham and had been rejected. She sank back mournfully on the sofa and felt that her hopes were crushed. Arthur was too premature, she said afterwards to her husband. Mrs. Pryor dearly loved long words. He should have waited until she gave some sign of responding to his feelings. It was not a week or two afterwards when she found that he actually delayed his departure for the sake of meeting Lucy again at a picnic, that she relinquished this idea. However, acting on this belief, she felt it right to lay no obstacles in the way of his departure. Indeed, what would have been the use? 
Arthur Winstanley, having once formed a resolution, was inflexible, and arguments could not find their way through his languid indifference to everything. End of chapter 24 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 25 of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher The Beginning of the End About a week after the croquet party before mentioned, Lewis Cunningham came riding down the hill behind Maungarewa. The sun was setting over the mountains, and a sea of golden clouds covered half the heavens. Full before Lewis's eyes, as he crested the hill, opened out the pale blue sky, shading into delicate green at the horizon, the deep purple mountains and the gold behind gradually flushing into rose colour. It was one of our really glorious New Zealand sunsets, and its beauty continually changed, developing some fresh type every moment. Lewis drew rein for a moment to enjoy the effect. In the opposite direction, the night rack came rolling up, ragged and brown. Lewis, turning that way, saw a cloud of dusk gloom, making the hills and gullies already misty with the coming darkness. At last, he looked down at the house beneath him. The paddock and garden in front were quite commanded from the position he occupied. He saw Lucy in the garden in a dress, which at that distance appeared white, trailing a shawl over one arm, and with her hat in her hand instead of on her head. She did not appear to be doing anything except watching the sunset, though she had a book in her hand, for as Lewis looked at her, he saw her drop it, and then stooped to pick it up. He rode down the hill, unsaddled his horse, and turned him out into the paddock. Then he went to join his sister in the garden. She came eagerly to meet him as soon as she saw him. Seen nearer, Lewis became aware that she had on a dress of some very pale blue material, not white, and that the book in her hand was one of Miss Alcott's charming American stories. Oh, Lewis, she cried, I'm so glad you've come. Papa has been called away suddenly on business and won't be back for a week, and I'm all by myself. So I suppose you want me to stay and look after you, said Lewis, stroking her rippling hair. He was very fond indeed of his sister, in his quiet, reserved fashion. Well, I don't mind if I do, but I shall have to go to the station off and on, so I warn you. That does not matter, replied Lucy, and I'm very glad you can stop. If you couldn't, I think I should have sent for Jeanie to come and stop with me till Papa turned up. I don't like being left a lone, lorn creature in this manner. That reminds me, said Lewis. I have a note for you somewhere from Mrs. Meredith. I saw Meredith in town today, and he gave it to me. After looking in every pocket but the right one, Lewis at last produced a tiny pink envelope, addressed to Miss Cunningham in Jeanie's angular handwriting. The note inside ran as follows. Monday. Dearest Lucy, we have quite decided that a picnic will be nicer than a sketching party, only you can sketch if you like, and I want you to come. It is to be my picnic, and Mrs. Pryor is going to help me. Thursday next is the day, and I shall be so glad, and so will Clinton, if you and Mr. Lewis will meet us at the Great Swamp at eleven o'clock. Clinton has given me another silk dress, and I want you to come and help me cut out the polonaise, and tell me how to trim it. It is such a sweet colour, just like apricot jam, but we can settle all about this on Thursday, so be sure you come, and don't forget, and oh, I hope it won't rain, your loving genie. P.S. Dr. Dacre is coming. Lucy read her note, and handed it to her brother without a word, who also perused it in silence. Only at the P.S. his face clouded over. He crushed Jeanie's little sheet of pink note paper in his hand, and asked at last, Shall you go, Lucy? Oh yes, I think so. I should like to go very much, she replied. Then she added, somewhat artfully, Jeanie will be offended if I don't. Lewis dropped the little ball of pink paper, into which he had at last reduced poor Jeanie's note, onto the gravel walk at his feet, stooped to pick it up, and said abruptly, don't go. Why not? asked Lucy, with equal conciseness. It appeared that his reason was not ready to deliver at a moment's notice, for he was a long time in answering. At last he said, I cannot tell you why, but I wish you would not go. I don't believe in presentiments. Isn't that what nervous people call them? But for all that there is a strong feeling in my mind against this picnic. I wish you would give it up. Nonsense, Lewis, returned his sister, obstinate in her turn for once. If you have no better reason to give for declining than that, I think it would indeed be absurd. Am I to disappoint Jeanie because you have taken a fancy into your head against her picnic? And what excuse could I make for refusing to go? She longed to tell him that she knew his objection was altogether founded on the postscript to Jeanie's note, but it was a subject on which she was too conscious to speak freely. She knew perfectly well in her heart that her own desire to accept the invitation was based upon the very words which had aroused Lewis's distaste to it. 
I wish Jeanie had not added that line, she thought, and then Lewis would not have said a word against my going. However, Lewis did not seem disposed to make any further remonstrance. He had said his say and had washed his hands of the matter. Finding that Lucy was determined upon going, he acquiesced, and on the appointed morning saddled his own horse as well as hers, and set forth with her as in duty bound. It was a hot day as usual. They were punctual at the place of meeting which Jeanie had mentioned, and, having joined company there with the rest of the party, they all rode together to the outskirts of the bush where they took their luncheon. A most sumptuous repast was found to have been provided. Jeanie, as principal giver of the feast, had brought two cold turkeys and a tongue with endless cakes and jam tarts. Mrs. Pryor had brought cold roast beef, lettuces for salad, and cherries enough to feast a small army, while Lucy, who had been sternly forbidden by the other ladies to provide anything, had, in defiance of the edict, brought with her a splendid ham, a profusion of strawberries, and a jar of thick cream. With the champagne, claret, and sherry, which the gentlemen had taken good care not to forget, they found that they could have camped out for a few days with much comfort if they had so desired. Arthur Winstanley was among the guests. He devoted himself, as usual, in his languid way, to Lucy all day. She received his attentions in the most unconstrained manner. Mrs. Pryor became at last convinced that her conjecture concerning a proposal and a rejection having passed between them must have been a mistaken one. It is the most puzzling case that ever came under my observation, she wrote home to a dear friend. But then, Arthur is a most remarkable man, and Miss Cunningham certainly understands his peculiar temperament more than anyone I ever knew. It was certainly a proof of the entirely platonic character of the relations between Arthur and Lucy that neither Clinton nor Dacre had ever felt in the least jealous of this man. Several of the people present at this picnic enjoyed the day most thoroughly. To more than one, it marked the end of a chapter, and was the last day of a life they had found a very agreeable one. About four o'clock in the afternoon, Lewis, who had gone to fetch back his horse, which had strayed away from the others, came up and directed the attention of the rest of the party to some rather ugly-looking clouds rising in the north. There will be a stormy night, he said. Those clouds signify atmospheric disturbance of some kind. My opinion is that the sooner we start for home, the better. His suggestion was considered a wise one by the majority of the party, and acted upon forthwith. Jeanie pouted and wanted to stay and risk it, but her husband scouted the idea, and put her on her horse before she had time to rebel. Dacre was then leading up Robin Hood and his own horse. He had Lucy in the saddle before Lewis could interpose, and they all started in twos and threes as quickly as they could. At the swamp, where the Cunninghams had met the others in the morning, there was a general shaking of hands and wishing goodbye. Arthur Winstanley wished Lucy farewell, and then suddenly, when he had gone about a hundred yards, turned back, rode up to her, and said it again. She looked a little surprised, and he added, I am going by the San Francisco Mail next week. Then, after a moment's pause, he remarked, You are the only one I am sorry to say farewell to. Thank you, replied Lucy, bowing to the compliment. I hope it is not forever. I hope not either, he returned, with real sincerity of look and tone, and then he took leave of her once more. When they came in sight of Mongarewa, the wind was rising, and a few heavy drops of rain were beginning to fall. The clouds were looming up in great murky masses over the mountains, and it was beginning to grow dark. Evidently there was a wild night in prospect. About a quarter of a mile from Mongarewa there was a shepherd's hut belonging to Mr. Cunningham, and as they passed it Lewis stopped to say a few words to one of the men. Ride on, he said to Lucy. I shall be with you again directly. He watched Dacre and herself as far as a small creek which they had to cross a hundred yards or so away. Here he saw Lucy stop to let her horse drink. Dacre followed her example, and at the same time bent over her to say something evidently meant for her ear alone, in a manner which Lewis thought excessively familiar and disagreeable. End of chapter 25 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 26 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Peckavy. Lewis was detained about half an hour. When he rode up to the house, he was surprised to see that there was no light in either of the sitting rooms, both of which faced the front of the house. The kitchen was at the back, and the whole line of the building was one unbroken mass of darkness. Very odd, thought Lewis. The place looks deserted. And yet they must have reached here long before now. I don't think anything could have happened to them in that short distance. But a vague feeling of uneasiness had arisen in his mind, and it only increased and deepened as he unsaddled his horse and turned him out. Robin Hood and Dacre's horse, if in the paddock, must have gone down to the creek to drink, for they were not in sight anywhere. 
As quickly as he could, Lewis walked into the house, all quite dark and quite still. Lewis stood for an instant in the hall, listening for some sound to guide him. There was a murmur of voices in the kitchen and a line of light beneath the door, nothing else. He turned at last into the drawing room. It was cold, empty, and deserted. Then he felt his way down the dark passage to the dining room, and, finding the door shut, he opened it and walked in. The evening had grown chilly with a sudden change in the weather, and there had been a fire made in the grate, but it had died down into a red mass of embers, warm but giving no light. Lewis threw on a log as he entered, and the flame leaped up, showing him Lucy in her riding habit, standing leaning against the mantelpiece, looking very pale, and Dacre seated at the table, his back turned towards her, his head resting on his crossed arms and his face hidden from sight. "'What on earth has happened?' asked Lewis involuntarily, with real alarm in his voice. Dacre raised his head, as though then for the first time aware of Lewis's presence. The next instant he sprang up and pushed his chair away. "'I have been waiting for you, Cunningham,' he said. "'I wanted to say a few words before I... I go. "'I owe your sister an apology, and I wanted to make it in your presence.' Lewis looked at his sister. She was still standing in just the same attitude by the fire, still staring down at the embers with the same white face. Dacre glanced at her also, and then went on more hurriedly. "'You see that something has happened,' he said, "'and I won't leave it to her to tell you what it was. "'I'll spare her that, at all events. "'It's all I can do for her now.' His voice broke a moment, then he recovered himself and went on firmly. "'You see, when we got here, I had to lift her off her horse. "'I've done it before, and now I suppose I've done it for the last time. "'But tonight, you'll hate me, Cunningham, but I deserve it. "'The devil tempted me, I suppose, and I kissed her, "'and said something mad and wild about asking her to be my wife.' Lewis set his teeth and made a step forwards. It appeared as though he were at last justified in the dislike he bore to this man. But the next instant he stopped, thoroughly bewildered. He had seen for some time that Dacre was in love with his sister, and he had dreaded lest Lucy should become his wife, but the course that events were now taking had never entered his imagination for a moment, and his astonishment absorbed every other feeling for the time. What could the fellow mean by saying that he was tempted of the devil? Dacre, meanwhile, looked again at Lucy, still drooping over the fire, one hand clenching her whip, the other mechanically holding up the folds of her riding habit. She did not move or speak, and in the silence within the wind came sweeping in a fierce gust, forerunner of the rising storm around the house outside. Dacre drew a long breath and went on hastily. Now that I have told you this, I must follow it up by another confession, still harder to make than the last. The temptation I have struggled against so long to keep back the truth is now over, and the only reparation I can make is to speak out openly. I owe it to her to do that. If you hate me now, Cunningham, you'll hate me and despise me ten times over in a moment. The truth is, that between your sister and myself there lies a deadly bar. I cannot cross it. I am married already. Lewis would have been upon him in a second. This was letting in the light with a vengeance on the bewilderment in which he had been groping. Both were powerful men, and Dacre was well-nigh desperate. What might not have followed... But in that instant, while they faced each other, an awful breathless pause, Lucy suddenly threw herself between. She laid one hand on Dacre's arm, and with the other kept Lewis back, and she spoke for the first time. It was wrong, she said, quite wrong, and a mistake from first to last. But you have suffered, and you are sorry. Lewis, stand back. If I forgive him, you can bear no grudge. You forgive me? Dacre answered. That is like Lucy, but I can never forgive myself. I ought to have told you this long ago. I ought never to have come here at all. It is easy to see all this now. It was harder then. Now it is all over. Yes, said Lucy, with her sweet voice perfectly calm and steady. It is over. We must say goodbye now. It is our duty. And because it is our duty, we must see each other's faces no more. The wind took up the story again and shook the house savagely, then moaned and died. That was all that followed Lucy's words. Dacre had sunk down again in his old place by the table, and his face was hidden by his arm. Nothing but his hard breathing broke the stillness, which seemed to last for hours, as if it would never come to an end. At last Lucy said again, with her voice a little more unsteady now, I shall pray for you every day, and we shall both be forgiven if we are sorry. Don't grieve about me, I shall live through this, though it seems hard now. Then Dacre said softly, but with intense passion, O oh God, hear me, and take from her all the suffering, and lay it upon me double. They had both quite forgotten Lewis's presence, but now suddenly he came forward, holding out his hand, and Dacre looked up. 
Dacre, he said, I've never liked you since I first knew you. No doubt you found that out long ago. But now I tell you that I will be your friend from this time forward if you will let me. A real friend, and not an empty form of words, and there's my hand on it. Dacre took it in his own, and they stood a moment, holding each other with a firm grasp. You've lost my sister, Lewis added, but you've gained an ally who will be true to you, you'll see. It seems a very poor exchange, but it's something after all. Dacre did not reply a word, but his hold on Lewis's hand tightened, and Lewis felt that the strange agreement was sealed. But after another moment, Dacre dropped Lewis's hand and turned away. I must go, he said. I cannot stay here any longer. Yes, I know it rains, but that does not matter. Don't follow me, Cunningham. I must go alone. With that, he went out, into the rain and darkness and desolation outside. End of chapter 26 Recording by Lewis Fletcher